If we go our whole lives seeking to feel happy based on how much people like us, or seeking to be happy based on how superior we are to other people in the means of possessions, of money, or of status, then we will forever spend our lives sad. And the reason why is because that is a lose-lose game. Hey guys, what's up? And welcome back to another Coffee Talk podcast episode. Today I am doing a chat or having a hat. Today I'm gonna to be hosting a conversation about the courage to be happy and the courage to be disliked. And technically today's chat is a book brew based off of these two books in particular. Grab your drinks, let me know what you're having down below or what you're doing down below. If you're not sipping on a beverage in our virtual cafe, what are you doing? Are you walking? Are you driving? Are you listening or are you watching? It's gonna be so hard for me not to to chug this right now because it's so refreshing. I made myself a like lemonade soda water mixture with like raspberry and acai and oh my gosh, it's so good. I've just combined all of my book notes from both of these books into one chat, more so from The Courage to be Disliked though because The Courage to be Happy is an equally amazing book. It was written secondary to The Courage to be Disliked. It goes a lot more into parenting and teaching and more so like how to basically guide the youth. I found it interesting even in hindsight to my own upbringing to read this book as well. My favorite thing about both of these books is the way they are written, specifically the fact that the entire premise behind each chapter from the start to the finish is there is a youth that comes to see a philosopher, specifically a philosopher who studies Adlerian psychology. The youth in the book really comes at the philosopher with a lot of the questions, a lot of the challenges that would be proposed by people in our time in our society, in our culture, in our generations against this philosophy that can sometimes seem a little generalized. Even the stuff I'm going to say today, there's probably some points that I'll, I'll make and these aren't necessarily my points, although I definitely found myself nodding in agreement a lot while reading these books. But if you have any kind of challenges or any kind of questions against some of the points that I'm going to make that are talked about in these books and talked about within Adlerian philosophy, read the books because the, the youth literally goes at it from every angle. The philosopher will say, it's your choice to be unhappy. Everybody can literally be happy from here on out. And the youth doesn't just challenge it, like he gets mad. He's like, how can you say that? And then brings up so many different scenarios and nuances. And the philosopher then comes back and explains so deeply, profoundly, but also very calmly in a way that you literally can't argue it. One of the points that's made in this book and a point that still sits with me to this day, especially these last few years where I've really struggled with how I've looked at the world and how I've come to understand and comprehend the world, the systems we run on and just so at large, you know, like the world can feel like a very complicated place. And I definitely have gotten lost in the complications and the confusions as to why it can feel like such a dark, evil place sometimes, just more so society, how we run the systems we run on. But the philosopher makes a note that the world and life itself are simple and the world that we live in is not objective, it's subjective and we give the world our own meaning. So quite literally, the way that we look at ourselves, the way that we look at our life, the way that we look at the world is not something that is just defined and we accept. It's something that is subjective to everybody's point of view, to everybody's perspective. And in a sense, we're choosing to believe or choosing to agree that the world is complicated, that the world is bad, that the world's a dark place and so on and so forth. The concept here is that if you change and not change like in a grandiose way, like just truly just change your goal or change your perspective, then you can change your view of the world, which again, sounds very simplified and we're gonna dive into it more. But by doing so, you can truly shift your state of happiness by just making a simple choice to believe and to agree the world is simple, life is simple. It can be complicated and if I wanna dive into the waves of that, I can make it seem really complicated or I can get into really complicated pockets of it, but at large, for the most part, the world is pretty simple. Life is pretty simple. Specifically, let's dive into the idea or the concept of goals because maybe you have a goal to be happy, right? I think most of us probably do, but are finding yourself feeling unhappy. So 
Another really important point is that when we look at life through cause and effect, which is very popularized specifically from philosophers like Freud, which by the way, Adlerian philosophy challenges a lot of the concepts from some of the more popularized philosophies about life in the world, including Freud, uh, Sigmund Freud. So in particular, Sigmund Freud was a big belief of cause and effect and that if you wanted to understand something, you had to go backwards to, or go back into what happened in order to see how it created what is. The way that Adlerian philosophy looks at this is that if you look at things from cause and effect, then you create determinism. And determinism means that you, you feel hopeless. You feel like, well, it doesn't matter what I do because what happened has already dictated what is and what's going to happen in the future, which can leave people feeling really hopeless, really helpless, really unhappy. If you actually look at what is the goal of what I'm looking to achieve or feel or satisfy in myself, then we can create our own effect or we give things its own meaning. This is where things are gonna get really tricky because and again, like this is probably, I'm assuming maybe not your first coffee talk. And if it is, then hi, welcome to the crew. But if it isn't your first coffee talk, you'll probably know that I struggle a lot with like wanting to always hit home and always get across that like, that I'm never trying to invalidate anybody's feelings. I'm never gonna invalidate anybody's experience. I'm only ever coming from my own point of view. And I never like to ruffle people's feathers, but I know that what I'm about to say and what is hit home a lot in this book is something that is very, perhaps, I don't even, like controversial maybe, but more so it can ruffle some serious feathers. But it's the idea that even our traumas, even the worst things that have happened in our past, when you stop looking at life through cause and effect, so AKA, I'll use my own personal example. I had a very dysfunctional, disconnected, emotionally abusive relationship with a primary person in my life, that cause could give me and has given me the effect to believe, okay, so because of that situation, that's why I do this. Or because of that situation, I'm determined to go the rest of my life like this. So because of that neglect and what I experienced as a baby, as an infant, as a toddler, as a child, as a teenager, those causes can create a certain effect and have created in my life a certain effect that I spent many years <laughs> trying to understand in order to comprehend why I was choosing to do the things I was doing, right? If you look at it through the Adlerian philosophy, it would actually be in reverse. I wanted to do the things I was doing and so I looked to my past and gave my past experiences specific meanings and blamed what I was doing on those causes. I actually had a goal to express whether it was my anger, whether it was my disappointment, my sadness, my frustration, and I had been suppressing those feelings for so long that in order to justify my actions or to justify the things I was doing, I gave a lot of weight to the cause. I gave a lot of weight to my trauma. I gave a lot of weight to that cause and effect to justify it. We actually have goals. In order to fulfill those goals, we give meaning to the past in order to justify what our goal is. And these goals can be very subconscious and never once in this whole philosophy in these books is anything ever looked at through the duality of good or bad or like are you choosing things morally or are you immoral like th that is never ever a point to be made so for instance again using my own example like when i was um cushion up quite a bit daily basis <laughs> like not being a healthy person when i was making really poor choices it wasn't because i was a bad person it wasn't because i was immoral boiled down to a lack of courage. And that is the main point that gets hit home over and over again, is it's not you're good or you're bad, or you're choosing this because you know, you're know you weak or whatever. It's just a lack of courage. And when you have courage, when you have the courage to express yourself, when you have the courage to be who you are, when you have the courage to own what you're feeling, what your goals are, whatever it is, then there is no longer so much weight and also so much power in the things that have happened in our past and they also can no longer dictate your present or your future. So this part of the book, I will say, comes with a lot of hard, hard reflections. We have to make space that for the most part, there is always gonna be a certain caliber 
of human reaction or human behavior that almost over identify with trauma or over identify with past experiences to the point that it's like that determines who you believe you are and when that determines who you believe you are you would feel lost without the things that have hurt you you would feel lost without these experiences that you have given so much meaning to that they have defined literally your personality your lifestyle a part of yourself so it directly challenges that and that comes with really really hard reflections like i could no longer for instance in my example be the person that could blame everything on being angry at my mom i could no longer be the person that allowed myself to have excuses because i didn't have that strong motherly role model growing up it was like i had to let go of that stop letting that be a part of my identity stop letting it dictate my present stop letting it dictate my future stop letting even the pain of those experiences give me like a false confidence or like a false bravado to kind of be like yeah like let me show you what I can do type of thing and not specifically to that person but just in, into the world you know like it was a false sense of confidence and, and that's why there were so many other issues with it is because I wasn't being real about what my goals really were it gets you to really think about what are my goals like holding on to my traumatic experience is fulfilling my need or my goal in order to continue this action and that can be really hard self-awareness and self-reflection because you'll realize, wow, why do I want to continue this action? And again, I want to hit home. It's not because you're a bad person. It's literally just a lack of courage. And all you need is the courage to shift your mindset in order to overcome that type of thinking or over-identifying. And we could bring it down a few levels to something a little softer like emotions. So even the emotions that we stir up inside of ourselves to an extent are to fulfill a purpose or a goal. An example of this would be like, I could choose in a way to stir up anger in myself so that I can justify being angry and yelling at somebody or being upset with somebody so that they'll submit to me. I could choose to stir up sadness inside of myself, to stir up a feeling of being victimized inside of myself by a certain situation so that when that sadness arises and I express said sadness, I'm fulfilling its purpose or it's fulfilling its purpose and my goal to make somebody feel guilty for what they've done to me. And to an extent, like this is where it gets hard for me again, because especially with emotions, I'm a water sign, baby, pure, pure water sign. I'm all about feeling your feels. I'm all about understanding the information our emotions give us, which is a lot of quality information. At the same time, to its core, do I believe that it is possible that we do stir up certain emotions inside of ourselves in order to influence our surroundings or influence the way that people react to our emotions? Yes. Do I think that it's still really important to not suppress our emotions or not try to change or alter our emotions forcibly and instead to feel them out in healthy ways? to better understand them and also what information they're giving us? Yes. I guess that's a point to this book that I wouldn't necessarily agree with where it's not to me at least that all emotions are just a means to an end, just a, something that we do to fulfill a goal for ourselves. I mean, <clears throat> oh, you could go deep with that though. I mean, is it a goal? Even creating a sadness around my experience growing up to an extent could help me fulfill my goal of healing, could help me fulfill my goal of processing. So again, I, yeah, actually maybe I do agree because that's not, again, if we take away the idea of things being good or bad or choosing these choices because we're good or bad and we just look at it strictly from courage, like it actually does make sense and it's not a bad thing to stir up a feeling of sadness within ourselves in order to help process things, in order to mourn or grieve. Damn, I don't know, that's a hard point. So to summarize, because I know I'm kind of spinning wheels as I'm talking about this with you, when we replace cause, so the actual cause of something with our goal, or our emotion, we realize that we use the cause, goal, emotion interchangeably, whatever it is, as a tool to fulfill a purpose that we have consciously or subconsciously chosen. We can let go of all of these beliefs, of all of this cause and effect, of all of this weight that we've given away and power that we've given away to our past, to our circumstances, to whatever it is, to our goals, to our lower purposes in order to choose the higher purpose of life is simple. It all is happening happening only ever in the here and now. Nothing from my past can determine my future. It's all just here and here today, right now, you can choose over and over again because it's not easy to rewire or change
change your beliefs or your philosophies or thinking, but to just choose over and over to let go and have the courage to say, yep, life is simple and I'm happy. That'll change or determine your life completely different. Sip it time before we jump into chapter two, because now we're going to talk about the other side of this pancake. The reason why we've cooked this pancake or this side of the pancake second is because we all know that the second side of the pancake is the one you're going to leave face up on your plate and pour maple syrup on, which gives it a little bit of importance, you know? Having the courage to be disliked goes hand in hand with having the courage to be happy, which we're going to dive into right after this sip. So the most important hit home point from these books, and one that still sits with me to this day, is all problems are interpersonal problems. And my reaction to this was like, how does that make sense though? How can every single problem that we face, every single problem that goes on in our lives come down to interpersonal? Like that doesn't make sense. Not every, there's, no, there's not always other people involved. Let's say you don't like yourself very much or you struggle with your self identity. You would not feel that way if you were the only person on this planet. So the way that we feel about ourselves is rooted in comparison. Everything that you could possibly think and even judge yourself for is rooted in comparison to not only what others are doing, but also what it, in social, the societal context of what society is deeming as good or bad. For instance, something that we might not judge ourselves for now, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we would have judged ourselves harshly for. But if nobody else existed and nobody else was reflecting back to you information that you were accepting subconsciously or consciously as true or false, you would not judge yourself against those things or make yourself feel wrong for not accepting or just naturally inhabiting those things. And thus the way you view yourself would change drastically. Now we can't just go off and live in a cave away from the world and we'll get to that point. But it is important to note that literally every single problem we could possibly have boils down to in relation to other people. Because if there was no relation to other people, we would have no problems. And that's why the main point, especially of the first book, is that freedom comes from being able to be disliked, having the courage to let yourself be disliked. Because if you go about your entire life trying to be liked and trying to mitigate or minimize any problems with other people, it will not make your life problemless. It'll actually make you feel really just tied up and not free. So the only way to actually be free, the only way to actually be happy and live with your problems or even in a sense or in a state more problemless is to be able to have the courage to be disliked because it's an inevitable fact that problems are bound to arise when there are interpersonal relationships and we live in a dimension where there are millions of billions of people on this planet and for us to live our lives there has to be interpersonal relationships meaning there will always be problems. And specifically Adler, the philosopher, goes into understanding that it is a very basic universal instinct to seek out a sense of superiority. And that comes again from comparison. You know, we compare ourselves to one another and we try and say like, oh, okay, I'm doing better than that person, but that person's kind of doing a bit better than me. And to an extent, if we were going to look at cause and effect, that cause could create the effect of motivating ourselves to do better, right? To do more. But Adler believed seeking superiority over other people, but also having people superior to you so that you're constantly motivated to climb for more is very toxic and can lead to a very imbalanced worldview and also a very imbalanced world where we're constantly trying to one up each other, which ruins any type of chance that there being a sense of true deeply founded community feeling. And we need that deeply founded community feeling. We need to have concern for others and care for others in order for all of us to thrive. Again, think of all of the problems that we face in the world. If we were to stop trying to one up each other, think of the people at the very, very, very top. Like we don't even know, I don't even know what games they're playing up there, but they're definitely playing some games at the top, that 1% in order to like be the most powerful person on the planet. Imagine that didn't exist. Imagine that our way of thinking was actually a lot more concerned for other people and communal and wanted the elevation and the horizontal relationship instead of vertical relationship of all of the people on the planet. Imagine how that would drastically change the world. But our seeking for that superiority creates competition and competitive thinking creates 
a toxic environment which doesn't allow these ways of living to coexist. I mean, they can, but they completely counteract each other, they completely challenge each other and create systems of comparison which creates problems that we necessarily don't have to have. Specifically, it's emphasized that the only way to actually have a healthy sense of inferiority is to only have it in relation to yourself. So always just trying to do better than who you were yesterday. And you don't always have to, just as like a disclaimer, do better than who you were yesterday. But if you want to compare yourself, if you want to have or seek out superiority, only ever seek it with yourself. Only try to outdo yourself. Only try to do better than your past. And not again from that cause and effect, but solely for your own evolution, for your own growth. Stop comparing your path or your journey to anybody else's. And that is the way that you can still keep that sense of motivation, still keep that instinctual behavior as a human being, that universal requirement that kind of was built into our dimension to want to chase superiority, just change the context. Put it only in the context of yourself. The main reason why is because if we go our whole lives seeking to feel happy based on how much people like us, or seeking to be happy based on how superior we are to other people in the means of possessions, of money, or of status, then we will forever spend our lives sad. And the reason why is because that is a lose-lose game. Either you are actually losing, so you either feel like nobody likes you, or in the game of comparison, you feel like you don't have the most things, you don't have the most likes or followers, you don't have the most money in the bank, your status or your job or whatever it is, isn't as good to someone else's, and thus you feel sad, you feel like a loser. Or if you're even a winner in that game, again, go back up to that top 1% of people that are living in, that, in the wealthiest bracket of the planet. I'm not even gonna get into the nitty gritty of how materialism cannot fulfill you. It literally just boils down to you're always then worried about the security of that status, that you're looking around making sure no one else is gonna one up you and bump you down. You're making sure that what you have, you can hold on to and secure it. It's an attachment, right? It's an attachment to things that are external from you. And the other side of this pancake, which apparently we're having pancakes, lots of pancakes today. The other side of this pancake, that need for superiority is also that need of recognition. The need that when I do A, the result should be be people recognizing my efforts, people recognizing my work. And when I come to you with these chats, I hope it is so embedded in every single chat that we have that I'm not giving you this information as someone who understands and lives by these values. I try my best, but like this is something that I can tell you from my career, from my job is a very hard thing to do. In fact, I don't even know if it's just, I, I'm like, again, can only come from my point of view. I'm sure it's a, a problem for all of us that no matter what job you're in, no matter what you do for a living, whether it's just you want to be recognized and appreciated for what you do as a girlfriend, wife, friend, mother, daughter, or recognized and loved for what you do at your job or for what you create or the art you put out into the world, that seeking, that need for validation, that need for recognition for the work that you're doing, for the things that you put out into the world, for the efforts that you make, it will forever keep the power in other people's hands. It will forever leave you feeling like nothing you do is worthy unless someone else deems it as such. And thus, again, we've created another interpersonal problem that can only be released. We can only let go of that problem when we let go the need to be recognized, when we let go the need to be superior, when we let go the need to be liked, all of which take courage and all of which are interpersonal problems that can stem out and branch out into a bazillion different materializations. If you want true true freedom. It does not come from isolating yourself from others. It does not come from releasing yourself from any interpersonal relationships. It comes from allowing yourself the freedom to literally be disliked because it's inevitable. And when you give yourself that freedom, when you allow yourself to stay in the world, to stay in society, to stay in your purpose, your true purpose with the freedom of knowing that the more free I am, the more free I live, the more people are bound to dislike me. And the more people that are disliking me is more proof that I'm actually activating and living in my freedom and in my own personal purpose. And something to note too, that is discussed heavily in these books as well, is this idea of the separation of tasks. 
meaning that you stop taking on the tasks of other people, including how other people perceive you, how other people judge you, or how other people might use you as their own marker of superiority. They might be fulfilling a purpose of trying to make themselves feel better by putting you down, by disliking you. That's still their task. That's still their business. Separate yourself. Stop trying to take on the tasks of other people. Lighten your load. Let people dislike you and know that it is none of your business and in a, to an extent. Focus on only the tasks that are yours. Focus on only you and your life. Making yourself believe that you are of the utmost importance and other people don't matter. That's not, that's not what we want either. It's a balance because we also don't want to take on the tasks of other people, whether it be those types of tasks of judgment of someone coming at you or disliking you, but also the tasks of someone else not doing so well, someone else facing issues, facing problems in us from out of our concern or our empathy for others wanting to solve those problems. When you have a healthy mindset, when you have healthy boundaries on not taking on the tasks of anyone, only taking on the tasks of you, your life and yourself, that stops you from dealing with a lot of these interpersonal problems and allows you to come from a very open, free state to have a genuine sense of concern for other people and to have a genuine wish or want for communal feeling, for living in community, for living in a horizontal, respective way with others. And so the cost of freedom is gonna be being disliked but you being disliked is someone else's task. It's someone else's responsibility to figure out and deal with, and it's not yours. All right, let's take a quick sip and then let's summarize because there's three, three things you can walk away from. If you're gonna take three points today on how to actually activate this in your life, there are three ways that you can live or three principles to live by that will allow you the ability to have the courage to be happy and to be disliked. So let's pause for a sip. <laughs> So the three principles that are needed in order to give yourself the courage to be happy and to be disliked, aka to be free. The first is self-acceptance and specifically self-acceptance in the here and now. You might feel like there's a lot of embedded thought patterns that have gotten you to the point in your life where feeling like you can just accept yourself or accept life or accept the world the way it is as it is right now, it might feel impossible. But it is one of the most important ingredients in order to actually live by this philosophy, simplify your life and give yourself that courage, that ability to be free, to be happy. And again, it doesn't come from whether or not you're worthy of accepting yourself, whether or not you're good at it or you're, you've done bad things. It's just courage. That's all it takes. It just takes courage. It is literally the biggest form of rebellion, especially in today's world, to fully accept yourself, to fully feel like you do not need for more, just as you are, who you are, the way things are. And from there, you will have such a strong sense of not only happiness, but also freedom from the need or the care of if other people like you or dislike you, if other people are doing better or worse than you, or if other people are giving you any sense of recognition at all because you're accepting yourself and that rooted internalized self-acceptance will stop you from reaching externally for others, for, for more, for anything really. But in today's world, in the world that we all live in, it's also gonna leave you free from the power of persuasion, of dictating your human behavior, the, the idea that you're gonna need the latest this, the latest that, following this trend, like just accept yourself and none of that shit will matter anymore. And if you catch yourself back in a state of self, unacceptance, self non-acceptance. I don't know how we would put that, but it's again, you don't blame yourself. You don't go, oh, this happened, so that happened. No, there is a reason why you're not accepting yourself, whether you want to explore it or not. And you can choose to let go of whatever reason you're choosing not to accept yourself or whatever purpose it gives you to not accept yourself. So you can choose whatever choices you're choosing because you don't accept yourself or you can just accept yourself. You could have that courage to do it over and over and over again. Emphasis on courage. The second is the mindset that others are my comrades. And this is an affirmation that again is hit home in this book and that I took with me from this book because it helped a lot, even specifically when I found myself feeling like I couldn't trust other people, which is something that I've definitely struggled with in my lifetime is that 
if I reaffirm to myself that other people are my comrades, other people are on my side. I have confidence in other people. And no, I'm not gonna look to my past. I'm not gonna go back there and say, well, look at all the times that I've been screwed over. Look at all the times that this cause created this effect because all that's doing is me looking for a reason to fulfill my purpose now to not trust people. So choosing to look at the world through the perspective as other people are my comrades means that not only are you allowing yourself to feel like it's okay if other people want to try and help me or have concern for me or cr again creating that community feeling but it also creates that horizontal respect that lateral relation to other people that allows you to feel like this world is a safe place to be that other people are your comrades other people are out there just trying to figure it out just like you are, you know? Even when someone is kind of rude to us, if we can just think in our heads like, no, other people are my comrades. Deep down, nobody actually truly wants to see other people in pain or suffering. And if they do, it's usually not actually about the person that's in pain or that they want to see suffer. It's something reflective as to what's going on inside of them. Because most, for the most part, instinctually as human beings, it is hurtful to see other people be hurt. And if we can have confidence and have belief that for the most part, people are good, for the most part, down to our souls, we truly do want or concern for other people and care for other people or the planet. Again, there are many other reasons why as once you come up from the root of the soul that those things don't actually end up materializing and the need for superiority or all of the things that we just talked about end up coming out into the world and manifesting in the places that we've found ourselves in having that genuine belief and confidence in other people and belief and confidence that other people are your comrades will stop you from feeling like you need to compete and compare and the third ingredient in order to give yourself the courage to be happy and to feel free to be disliked is contribution to the community feeling like you're contributing to the world in some way but again with emphasis on not needing to be recognized for it so if you went off and you lived in the woods in the middle of nowhere with no one to bother you and it was just you and your dogs and you doing all the things you wanted to do and living off that little plot of land in a sense, you could still fulfill this purpose of contributing to the world or contributing to community by the way that you upkept that little piece of land, the way that you allowed the trees to flourish, the animals to come, maybe you feed squirrels or birds or whatever it is, you know what I mean? So it like, again, you can choose the community that you wish to contribute to. You can choose the ways that you want to give to the world without that sense of recognition. It doesn't need to be like, giving yourself away or giving too much of yourself because again don't take on other people's tasks don't seek out recognition just find a way find a, a path in life that allows you to feel like you're contributing something to the planet to the world to this generation to this dimension that comes from a deep place inside of yourself and again the more you accept yourself the more you don't need it to be seen recognized or liked by other people likely the more fulfilling it's going to be, which is again going to give you more courage to live your life simply and freely. At the end of it, when it boils down to it, the idea or the premise behind this philosophy is that we ourselves give our lives, give our experiences, these subjective experiences, meaning. Odds are if you're feeling lost, it's because you're trying to be a specific or very boxed in way of being happy and or possibly one or both needing other people to like you and thus you're creating a rippling effect of determinism in your life instead seek out and source within yourself the courage to accept your life to accept who you are right here right now to accept the world right here right now as it is as we found it despite our past despite what we would have looked at before as cause and effect and instead look at it with a fresh pair of eyes that the world is simple that life is simple that honestly even the biggest issues that we face the world the earth will likely go on even if humans never find a way to solve our problems our interpersonal problems on a collective level if you can just accept that it's simple and you change 
your goal. You change your purpose. You will change the meaning of your life and you will set yourself free. And that, my friends, is a collective thought process of my notes on the courage to be disliked and the courage to be happy. I can't recommend enough grabbing these books, giving them a good read, letting me know your notes and your thoughts and your takeaways because everybody's perception is obviously gonna be different. Or if you have read them and you have any thoughts or takeaways, leave them in the comment section over on YouTube. Even if you haven't read these books and this generated any kind of thoughts or things that you'd wish to share, I'd love to hear. Keep the conversations going down below. Outside of that, thank you for joining me for this chat. I love you guys all the way to the moon and back, and I'll see you guys all in our next Coffee Talk podcast episode. Bye, everyone.